for our understanding. So, Father, we offer this time and I pray that um, the words that come from my mouth would be honouring to you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I want to um, introduce the story of the woman who was bleeding to you today and do a couple of things to bring out the prophetic nature of this event and also to bring out the absolute esteem by which God created woman. So I'm reading from the Complete Jewish Bible. Does anybody here use a Complete Jewish Bible? You seen it? Yeah, you do, Graham? Yeah, it's just interesting. It's got extra things in it. It's written by a Messianic Jew. And um, I like to read that along with my other one that's got a commentary as well. But it just has some other interesting facts about the Jewish and the Hebrew customs and things like that. It's not got everything in it, of course, but it is interesting. You do find some, some good stuff in there. Or one of the things that it does is, it, is it, it uses the original names, the Hebrew names for people and places. So, But we'll explain that as we go along. So let's just read this first. As he went with the crowds on every side, virtually choking him, a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and could not be healed by anyone came up behind him and touched the tzitzit on his robe. Instantly, her hemorrhaging, her hemorrhaging stopped. <clears throat> and so is technology. You know what, I often think, if I get to heaven and there's a computer there, I'm going to think I'm in hell. <laughs> Yeshua, that's Jesus asked, who touched me? And when they denied, they all denied doing it, Kepha, that's Peter, said, Rabbi, the crowds are hemming you in and jostling you. But Yeshua said, someone did touch me because I felt power go out from me. As he went... Did I go the wrong way? Okay, I'll read it to you. How's that? Seeing she could not escape notice, the woman, quaking with fear, threw herself down before him and confessed in front of everyone why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. He said to her, My daughter, your trust has saved you. Go in peace. This woman had been bleeding for 12 years, that's a long time. And what was her life like? For that we have to go to Leviticus 15.25. What did this mean for her? Did I go too fast or what, what am I doing wrong here? I'll get Jeff to do it. Okay, what Leviticus says is really quite shocking. And a lot of people have misunderstood this. I certainly did for many, many years. Couldn't understand it at all. Leviticus 15.25 says this. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not during her period, or if her discharge lasts beyond the normal end of her period, then throughout the time she is having an unclean discharge, she will be as when she is in nida. That's a Hebrew word. She is unclean. Now, I used to read this and think, that's not fair. You know, God created women's bodies to bear children and that's a natural part of what happens. So why are, why are we unclean? And I think 
what we need to understand is that that's, that's at this place that there's more to this story because the woman herself is not unclean but she's representing something, okay? Get a hold of that. So it's not to say you're unclean, but it's to say there's, there's more to this story. You see, when a woman is of childbearing age, we all know every month her body prepares her womb to receive and nurture new life. The woman's body is designed to be a picture of the body of the Messiah preparing to bring forth new life. That's the Hebraic understanding. When that life doesn't conceive, the blood lining in the womb comes away and then the, no the new cycle begins. All right? She's preparing her body to have new life come forth. But this Leviticus passage describes a woman in this situation as unclean. She's in a state of nida because she can't at that point bring forth new life. Now, nida, this uncleanness, represents a time of living in the flesh. It's a time of unproductivity. In fact, everything that she touched was considered unclean. And it's a, and it's a state, it's, it's representing the state of sinfulness, of uncleanness before God, rather than a spirit of purity. She's walking in the flesh. That's what it's representing. It's not saying that she herself is. It's saying that's what her body at this particular time is representing. Are you with me? During those seven days that she's having her menstrual cycle, she has to therefore leave the family home. In the Hebrew, that's what she did. As a Jewish woman, she left the Hebrew home. She went to live with a bunch of other women who were also in the same situation into a particular place. All the women there gathered together. And this place that they gathered was actually outside the camp. It was outside the community. There's a little link beginning to happen here. Can you see it? We'll keep going. She's outside the community where her blood is shed. And blood being shed means death. Cannot be productive, can't bring forth new life. Are you with me? I'm sorry, this is a very intimate topic, isn't it? Um, and I hope that nobody's embarrassed by it, but it's in the Bible and it's got meaning. So the woman, because she's bleeding, is said to have come in contact with death because the blood is flowing from her. Now, Jesus at Golgotha shed his blood outside the camp. He was an outcast. The Golgotha was the refuse dump of the city. So he's out there shedding his blood, dying. Interesting here how God respects women. You imagine today if every woman, when she had her menstrual cycle, left the family home and had a seven-day break. Wow. Oh, wow. They got it right. You know, didn't have to do all the chores that you would normally do. She was there to fellowship with other women and just to pray and just to, you know, enjoy that time. Woohoo! Bring it on. At the end of that seven days, what she would do then was go through a particular ritual called a mikvah. It was a mikvah bathing process. 
And what would happen is that she would then stand before uh, water. She would turn and let the water flow over her. So she would face the water and let it flow over her. It was very ritualistic. In fact, that's what Bathsheba was doing on the roof when David saw her. She was going through the mikvah bath. A bride, a Hebrew bride, would do that the night of her wedding as well. So what does that mean? The mikvah that is the living water. Who called himself the living water? Yeshua. Jesus. So she turns... And she faces the living water and allows that living water to flow over her. That turning, changing direction from impurity to purity as he cleanses her. Isn't that a great picture? That's repentance when you turn, isn't it? When you turn, you face the other way. You face towards God. So Jesus is our mikvah. Okay? From a Messianic and Hebrew perspective, what this woman was actually doing, even though she was probably unaware of the prophetic nature of her act, she was coming to Jesus for her cleansing mikvah. She may not have realised it. In fact, she probably didn't. But Jesus is the one who cleanses us from our impurity. When we are impure, when we're walking in the flesh, what we touch becomes impure. By faith, Jesus is the living water who cleans and forgives us to walk again in his grace. Let's go back to the beginning now and get a bit more out of this. As he went with the crowds on every side, virtually choking him, a woman who had her hemorrhage for 12 years and couldn't be healed by anyone, came up behind him and touched the zitzit on his robe. Instantly, her hemorrhaging stopped. So what about this woman? She shouldn't have been in the crowd, right? She shouldn't have been there. And she knew that. She was not allowed in the temple to worship for 12 years. She was considered an outcast by her community, isolated. She'd spent everything she had, so she's living in poverty. She was desperate. She was ashamed because in those days, not to bear children was a a place of shame. She was still of menstruating age but unable to bring forth life. And she crept up from behind him because she didn't want to defile a rabbi by touching him. So what's the tzitzit all about? Okay. If you've walked in Caulfield at any time on a Saturday, you'll notice Jewish people walking to the synagogue. And they wear, the the men wear a prayer shawl. It's usually blue and white. They wear this prayer shawl. And I want to demonstrate to you what what it does. The prayer shawl has on it little tassels. Okay? That's the tzitzit. Some translations say that she touched his clothing. Some say she touched his robe, his outer garments or the fringe. The fringe, the tzitzit. And it's also interesting that when Jesus went into Jerusalem, remember that bit where he said, um, Oh, Jerusalem, how I've longed to gather you under my wings like a hen gathers her chicks. Remember that? Let me demonstrate what that means. If I put this on, can you hear me now, Oscar Cut? If I put 
be gone. And this is not this is not a prayer shirt, by the way, of course. Even though it's just the wind, the name for the wind, nuts. It's power of long nuts. Each long and terrible wind took me home. So she comes up behind him and she touches the fringe, the tzitzit. Now the tzitzit was knotted in a particular way. It was knotted with four cords that spelled out the name of God. And in those four cords was a purple thread which signified that the wearer of that shawl was a priest. Now, is Jesus not our high priest? Okay? And he bears the name of God on his shoulders, doesn't he? So she comes up behind him and she touches the tzitzit and she says, if only I could touch him. What's she reaching for? She's reaching for her mikvah. She's reaching for her, for the name of God. She's a believer full on, isn't she? And then Jesus feels the power go out of him. And she feels the fact that she is healed. Okay. Then Jesus does the unthinkable. Oh, my goodness. What is he thinking? He says... Yeshua asked, who touched me? Imagine if you were the woman. Oh, my goodness. I'm not supposed to be here. When they all denied doing it, Kepha said, Rabbi, come on. You crazy? (laughs) The crowds are hemming you in and jostling you. But Yeshua said, someone did touch me because I felt power go out of me. I can imagine what this poor woman was thinking. Why would you do this to me? What the heck are you doing? Do you want to shame me? you want to expose me now? So what happens? Seeing she could not escape notice, the woman, quaking with fear, I bet she was, threw herself down before him and confessed in front of everyone why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. There's a testimony here now. And then he says to her, my daughter, your trust has saved you. Go in peace. There's two things. He calls her my daughter. Isn't that fantastic? In other words, you're mine. You belong. You've been isolated from family for so long, but you belong to me. You haven't tainted me by touching me. You can be restored to your family. My grace, my power is sufficient to make you pure again. I am your mikvah. And then he says, go in peace. That word peace is shalom. That means peace in every way, emotionally, intellectually, relationally, every way, peace. Go in peace. He says, bring forth new life now. Be a part of the community again. No more isolation, 
No more hiding, no more shame, no more emotional pain, sorrow. And then the final thing that he does, because of that, he validates her in front of all the community. He says, now you guys know this woman is now clean. That's why he exposed her. Couldn't have done that. She couldn't just go and say, oh, I've been healed, so therefore I can come back into the community. No, no, no. She gets the word from Jesus, a testimony to the crowd that she's been healed and she's now pure and she can be reinstated into her family and her fellowship. And she can go back to worship in the temple. See, in lots of ways, Jesus was a, a rebel, wasn't he? He did the unexpected, but he did it for a reason. There's always a reason. He defies the convention of the day, which he would have done here. Right? She certainly did. But, she, but he didn't condemn her for it. You shouldn't have been here. He did the exact opposite. Can you see how this is a prophetic event? It's a little mirroring of what Jesus would do at the cross in shedding his own blood, becoming unclean for us, taking it on himself. All right? And then when we come to him, we are clean, we are forgiven. And it's also a measure of how our bodies are made in such a beautiful, beautiful way to reflect God, to reflect what God has created in us. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for for your word that is so rich and so powerful and so full of meaning. We could never ever get to the to to say that we understand it all because there's just new things that you bring out all the time. No person could have planned your word. It's given by you because it hangs together at every place to bring about our understanding of your kingdom, your purposes, and what you've achieved in Jesus Christ. We thank you for these small pictures, Lord, that just enrich our lives and our understanding of who you are and your great love for us. So we give you praise, we love you, we thank you for your word. And I pray that any seeds that get planted today, Lord, you would water them, nurture them, bring forth fruit in whatever way. In Jesus' name, amen.